Once you learn how to determine the electron configuration of an atom by using the periodic table and the atom's placement in the periodic table, it rapidly becomes important that we can focus not on the entire configuration, but on the configuration of the valence electrons. Now, why is that important? First of all, what are valence electrons? Now, a lot of people equate the word valence with outermost, but that's really not the meaning of the word valence. The word valence literally is a reference to the atom's reactivity with other atoms. How an atom behaves when it encounters another atom. Atom A, say, wanders along and bumps into atom B. And they interact in a certain way. And of course, the reason they react or don't react is based upon what's happening with the electrons on the surface of the atom. So when we refer to valence electrons, we're, we are referring to reactivity. We're talking about the electrons that react. And those are the outermost electrons, the electrons having the highest principal quantum numbers. Um, so if we are interested in just, say, a configuration total for phosphorus, that's relatively easy. We would say, well, phosphorus is 1s2 for its first two electrons, 2s2 for the next two electrons, 2p6 for the next six electrons, 3s2 for the next two, and then 3p3. And that would be the complete electron configuration for phosphorus. However, if we want to talk about the valence configuration of phosphorus, well, the electrons that are in the outermost or highest principal energy level are these electrons here and here, those with a principal quantum number 3. So actually, the valence configuration of phosphorus is simply 3s2, 3p3. And there's a quick and easy way to get a valence configuration without having to tediously work through the entire electron configuration. Instead, to get the valence configuration, we really only have to know two things. We have to know, A, what period the atom's in, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7. And we have to know what main group the atom's in. So, just for argument, let's pick selenium, atomic number 34. Well, I know that any atom found in the fourth period of the periodic table, as selenium is, has four for its valence level. And of course, that's because all these atoms, once you filled argon's core, would start with 4s2 and then start filling the 3d with electrons, and then go to the 4p. But the valence level, the highest principal quantum number, is 4. So of course, if we're in the fourth period and start with 4s2, 4 is going to be our highest principal quantum number. So for any atom, I know the valence level by simply looking at what period it's in. Then to get the configuration of electrons in that level, I need only know what main group the atom's in. And selenium is found in main group 6. And that means, as with any group 6 atom, it has six valence electrons. So of course, the first two would complete the S sublevel in the fourth energy level, leaving four left over to go into the P sublevel because 2 plus 4 is 6 electrons. So yes, by simply knowing what period the atom's in, we know its valence level. And by knowing what main group it's in, we know how the how, not only how many electrons it has in the valence level, but how they have to be distributed. Another couple of examples quickly, if we were silicon, number 14. Well, we're in the third period, so 3 is our principal quantum number for the valence level. And we are in group four, so we have four valence electrons. The first two would fill out the lowest energy sublevel S, and the next two would be placed in the 3P. And this would be the valence configuration of silicon. If we wanted to know radon's valence configuration, easy. It's in period six, so its valence level is six. And it has, because it's in group eight, eight valence electrons. 
So not only does it fill the S sublevel with two, it has six left over for the P sublevel as well. So if we chose a metal, say potassium, group one, well, it's period four, so its valence level is four, and it has only one electron, and it goes in the S sublevel. So as quickly and easily as you can look up period and main group, you know immediately what the valence configuration itself is without having to write out the entire electron configuration. So the only remaining question is, well, what if I chose, say, instead of a main group element, a transition metal or a rare earth metal? Let's take iron as an example. Well, almost all of the transition and rare earth metals behave just like group two metals. And that's because most of their configurations start with S2 before we talk about the D's or the F's. And the two electrons in the S are in a higher energy level than the electrons in the F's or D's that follow them. For instance, even if we were talking about, say, uh, tungsten right here, its configuration would be the xenon core followed by 6S2, 4F14, and 5D4. But you see, 5D and 4F are not valence electrons. The outer or highest principal energy level was 6, and so these are the two that are in the S sublevel of the highest principal quantum number, 6. So 6 is the valence level, and it has two electrons, even if it's tungsten. So it's behaving like a group 2 atom. So almost all of these atoms, I can do the same thing I was doing with main group elements. It's just that I immediately think, well, they're just like a group two element in that period. So for instance, if I wanted iron, I'd simply go, hey, we're in period four. Four is the valence level. And iron's going to behave like main group two. So it should have two 4s electrons. And in fact, it does. Because if we did the entire configuration, it would have argon's core followed by 4s2, followed by 3d6. So yes, these are the two valence electrons, and they are 4s electrons. So then why don't we say all elements that aren't in the main group behave like group 2 elements? Well, that's because many of them don't follow Aufbau, namely the outward filling of sublevels according to energy, and that you don't fill a higher energy sublevel till you've filled the lower energy sublevels first. And there are actually quite a number, over two dozen atoms that don't obey Aufbau, but most of them are very rare or man-made elements, and we don't encounter them very often in chemistry. But there are five noticeable outliers, five very common atoms that we refer to frequently in chemistry that don't obey Aufbau. And they are these three precious metals, copper, silver, gold. And not surprisingly, in the same group, they tend to behave the same. And then over here in subgroup six, uh, we see, well, it's subgroup 4, but it is group 6 under the new classification of 1 through 18. We also find chromium and molybdenum, which are exceptions to Aufbau. And here's why they're exceptions. If an atom can achieve an electron configuration where all of its sublevels are half filled with electrons or filled it's a very stable situation for that atom. So if we were not knowledgeable that, say, copper was an exception to Aufbau, we might immediately write its configuration as having argon's core followed by 4s2 and then 3d1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And that's how we'd write the ground state unexcited electron configuration of copper if we did not know that it was an exception. But this is not particularly stable because while all the sublevels in the core are filled, good, as is the 4s sublevel, good, the d sublevel can hold 10 and it only has 9. 
and that's neither half filled nor filled and it creates a certain amount of instability in the atom. So copper manages to solve that problem very simply by promoting one of these electrons to a slightly higher energy level. And yes, D, 3D is only slightly greater in energy than 4S. And in fact, the ground state, unexcited electron configuration of copper is 4S1, 3D10 with argon's core, which fills the 3D sublevel, good, and leaves the S sublevel half filled, also good. And so, in fact, this is the electron configuration for copper. This is not. Not surprisingly, silver and gold do the same thing. Um, silver would be Krypton's core, it's a larger atom, more electrons, followed by 5s2 and 4d9. And if you weren't paying attention to the exceptions, you would think that's a configuration. But in fact, it too promotes one of the s electrons up to the d sublevel. So even though it has slightly greater energy, it is a more stable atom. And net net, that in turn implies lower energy overall. So once again, exception to Aufbau. And finally, in the same vein, you would also expect that gold would do the same sort of thing. The only difference being that we have a still larger core and we have 6s2 and let's not forget the 4f14 non-core electrons because after 56 comes 57. But then you would think you have 5d9 but you don't. You in fact have 6s1 and 5d10. So they all do the same thing. How about the other two common exceptions to Aufbau? Those being chromium and molybdenum? Well, you can probably already figure out what's going on. If you didn't know that chromium was an exception, you would think it has argon's core, 4s2, and 3d4. And you have full, full, and 4 tenths full. But by simple promotion of an electron to a slightly higher energy, Instead, you have argon core, 4s1, 3d5. Half filled, half filled, full, better than full, full, and fractionally filled, 4 tenths, 2 fifths full. So yes, this is the actual ground state configuration for chromium. Molybdenum does the same thing, it's just that it promotes a 5s up to the 4d, and it has a 5s1, 4d5 configuration.